Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome. Uh, it's great to see such a turnout, but not surprising uh, given the topic. Um, you know, welcome to our conversation, uh, really of uh, faculty across the campus about uh, Ukraine. Um, you know, one year later, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to overstate the significance of the conversation that we're gonna have or the event really. I mean, in many ways, it's changed the world. And in, in my mind, it's sort of the, almost the equivalent of 9-11 of a, a generation earlier in terms of its, its, its overall significance. Uh, in, in thinking about this um, event, I, I look back at uh, uh, an essay that Madeleine Albright published the day before the invasion uh, in the New York Times. The headline was, Putin is making an historic mistake. Um, and Madeline predicted, unlike most, that Russia would stumble, uh, that the West would rally, and she predicted that the long-term consequences for Russia would be disastrous. Like so many other moments in her life, I think Madeline was quite prescient. Um, uh, Russia has stumbled, uh, gross miscalculations uh, by Putin in terms of uh, the effectiveness of their military, and we've observed the ways in which Ukraine um, and indeed the West has rallied, and she was right about that. Uh, um, to the extent that NATO enlargement was a concern of, of Putin's, uh, he has really accelerated that, um, uh, much to, I'm sure, his, his surprise. So in, in many ways, she foresaw that, but so much has happened has been, in some ways, or the importance of what's happened is, was, was in some ways unforeseen. And the, there's a lot that's, well, this story is, is you, you know, we don't know the ending of this story yet, uh, to be sure. And, you know, it's such a shock, uh, the idea, the images of war in Europe, it shocked, you know, the Ukrainians, they did, to the last minute, they didn't believe that this could actually happen. Most of the West just couldn't, it's hard to wrap your head around the images of tanks rumbling across the border. They seem like something out of a, a century ago almost, um, and yet there it is. And, um, you know, colossal damage images of, of, of refugees in, in extraordinary numbers uh, of fleeing the, the country. Um, and not just the fact of war, which was a shock, but the way it's been conducted, the, uh, you know, the atrocities, the, the violations of what we, what we think of as the legitimate ways to wage war in the modern world, human rights, but violations that we already know are in the thousands. Um, and so in some ways, what's at stake here is, is the whole global order around rule of law, uh, law of war, uh, and just to, not to exaggerate too much, as we see China cozying up to Russia, as you see the West aligning, are we we're seeing, uh, perhaps not in such a simplistic term as, as Biden has made it out, the battle between democracy and autocracy, although there's some truth to that formulation, but you are seeing uh, a massive, uh, sig potentially significant uh, realignment in, in, the, in the global order. And you're watching countries like India figure out where to position themselves in that world. So. Uh, in, in, you know, and I could go on, and indeed the panel will talk about many dimensions of of this war, including uh, gender dimensions, uh, the probability of uh, the the ways in which the media is being is is playing out, um, as well as, of course, the questions about the the war itself. Um, we will see where this story ends. Um, we don't know yet about the war itself, whether the more sophisticated weapons being provided by the West will outweigh the huge manpower advantage that Russia has on the ground and how that will play out. We don't know, who, we don't know who's on whose side time is on, uh, whether the West, having rallied, will hold. Uh, I know, uh, Seth, you'll talk about the uh, American politics here um, and how much longer the U.S. resolve will, will hold. Uh, Putin still may prevail. Um, he thinks time is on his side. And all these big questions that I've, I've mentioned here about the future of the global order, both in terms of the rules of the game, the liberal order that um, 
the aspirations around human rights and the ways in which nations engage with each other and behave, um, and the questions about, as I said, these global alignment. Well, there's so much to talk about um, and so little time, so I'll stop talking. Uh, we have a fabulous panel uh, uh, of colleagues from across the campus um, to help us think through this, and I know there'll be opportunities to ask questions and to engage with them. Um, so let me, let me uh, I will turn it over to our um, moderator. Um, so um, Professor Andrea Stanton, who is the as Associate Professor of Islamic Studies and Senior Associate Dean in the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. And Andrea, it's so great to have a colleague from CAUSE and to be partnering with you and have partners from across the campus to discuss this today. Uh, Andrea will make some additional introductory remarks, I think, and uh, introduce our panelists and moderate the discussion. So thanks so much, Andrea, for doing that. Thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you very much, Fritz, um, especially for this really thoughtful framing of, I think, the critical aspects of this ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Um, and I also would like to thank all of my colleagues uh, for being so willing to share their time and expertise. And thank all of you for coming uh, after a year uh, conflict that's been in the headlines for quite some time. Uh, I think it's it's really nice. We're really thrilled to see how many people have um, have come out to hear more, both in person and virtually. So in terms of format, um, each of our panelists will speak for six to eight minutes. You'll see me giving a hopefully subtle but firm two minute signal at six minutes. Um, <clears throat> also, we've asked everybody to speak without slides to keep things moving. Um, and that will give us a good amount of time for questions from the audience. So for people who are in person, we'll have you use a microphone so that our online audience can hear. And for um, our colleagues who are online, and um, we'll have you type your questions and then we'll read them aloud so our in-person audience can hear. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleagues, and I will do that in the order that they're speaking, and then they'll just be able to go one after the other. So to my right, um, Lewis Griffith is a teaching professor and associate dean here at the Corbell School. His work centers around questions of the utility and consequences of force in the 21st century. Next is Seth Maskett, a professor of political science and director of the Center on American Politics. He researches and teaches on American political parties, legislatures, campaigns, and elections. And then next will be Marie Berry, um, who is director of the C Center and an associate professor here at the Corbell School. Um, she is an expert on women and war. After that, we'll hear from Nadia Kaneva, um, who is Associate Professor of Strategic Communication and directs the Masters in Media and Public Communication, as well as the Graduate Certificate in Public Diplomacy. She's a faculty affiliate here at the C Center and an expert on public diplomacy and nation branding. And then finally, our last panelist will be Karima Damanhuri, who is Assistant Professor of Journalism and Media Studies and a faculty affiliate um, here at the Center for Middle East Studies. He is an expert on media campaigns by military non state actors and by nation states. So um, look forward to hearing from each of you in turn. And Lou, please start us off. OK, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, let me get this out of the way first. As a student pointed out, one of our student workers in student affairs, no, I did not intentionally wear camo uh, today. For my role, this is completely what happens when you start with brown shoes. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me start by sort of borrowing from the, from the dean's comment. Um, why was Madeleine Albright right? What are the key things that happened in the last year that are the things that either that will set us up for understanding what goes on in the in the coming year? And basically, there are three of them from us from a geostrategic standpoint. There are lots of other consequences of which there are people up here who know far more about than I do. But from a geostrategic standpoint, there's something we need to remember. The most shocking thing is that Ukraine hasn't lost yet. Um, we're now having a conversation about how this war will play out three weeks in, four weeks in, six weeks in. We weren't having that conversation. Virtually no one was having that conversation. To include the Ukrainians, which I think we forget, everything we've watched happen has been both a surprise and on the fly. One of the big transitions you're going to see for the quote unquote spring offensive and beyond is that people who had previously waited or thought this would end, China being a good example, now have to make decisions about how they want to be involved in what has become a long sustained potentially uh, quasi-permanent conflict in their lives. And that's really new. This was going to be over in four weeks. Um, the sanctions that were put in place were punitive, not coercive. Um, all sorts of things that have happened were not envisioned as being part of some sort of long-term war campaign. This is an unusual. Almost all wars that start, the aggressor assumes 
is going to end in the way they foretold, and that rarely happens. But everybody involved now has to figure out what to do with a war that goes on into a second season, into a third season. And that's really different. Two, Europe didn't blink. Uh, the other thing I don't think we remember from a year ago when we were having these sorts of panels is we had lots of European experts here in our community and from Europe who came here and their predictions in November and, and, and late October were rioting in the streets, the collapse of certain weaker regimes when energy prices shot up, uh, the inability of certain governments to even make sacrifices in the name of Ukraine on energy costs or inflation, et cetera. That didn't happen. Um, part of that's a fluke of really good weather in Europe, but part of that is also the European project responded in a way that frankly Russia didn't think it possibly could on fuel, on, on energy policy, on arms transfers. Certainly Germany is an obvious symbol of that, but lots of countries are doing things that you would not have predicted they'd be doing or at least allowing to be done in their name uh, as, as little as nine months ago. And the last one is, and this is sort of a thing that did happen that I don't think Vladimir Putin and many others expected, is that Cold War logics kicked back in. Vladimir Putin has spent a lot of time, including Monday, trying to find ways to come up with uh, escalatory threats, trying to find mechanisms that he can pull that cause the West to think that if they continue to support the Ukraine, uh, they will be subject to either a wider war or nuclear threats, or all sorts of economic or potentially geostrategic consequences. Um, I think the China piece is a bit of this as well. But the moral of the story is, when in fact push came to shove, at least for year one, the fact that you had two cold warriors on either side of this conflict, Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin, meant that the old logic kicked in. Vladimir Putin would say something provocative and, and sort of saber rattling. And everyone who worked for Vladimir Putin would get up and go, but we're not talking about that seriously yet. Um, that is astoundingly reassuring to European allies. That is astoundingly reassuring. Um, there's a bit of a sense that we've done this before. And I think in an interesting twist, we have. And so you ended up with this sort of very traditional proxy war. And that may be horrible for the people of Ukraine, and it may be horrible for any Russian soldier who's sent to fight it. But it has contained it in a way that, frankly, an entire generation of political leadership understands. Um, and that has, that has sort of kept it in a manageable state uh, that may or may not continue in the future, but those three things explain year one, if you will. So everything that you're watching now, in my opinion, and, and then I'll try to role model a proper six minutes, everything you're, you're, you're watching now is countries trying to adjust, actors trying to adjust, states trying to adjust to an actual sustained campaign, the need to actually wage a war over time. Everything from figuring out how to send tanks to do the EU running around looking for new sanctions to uh, various efforts by the Chinese to find a way to both gain some leverage and potentially be a negotiating partner. All of these things are developments that no one would have done three months ago when the war might end over the winter. The war is unlikely to end this year. Although I think it's still possible a dramatic military breakthrough on either side could happen, which is why neither side currently wants to negotiate much. Um, but the situation is simply that all wars transition, and this war can go one of two ways. It can go up in terms of escalatory action, although Russia is out of options in Ukraine, and if the red lines hold, it doesn't have a lot of options. Or it can settle in and become a hurting stalemate, which is negotiated not in terms of conflict resolution, but on somebody drawing a line and taking a break. But all of that is a new conversation, is my big point. None of those things were being discussed until very recently, and a long-term plan, because everybody thought it would be over by now. Hi, OK. Um, thanks so much. So uh, I was going to talk about things from the perspective of the U.S., because it's the only perspective I know. Um, and uh, I wanted to focus on, you know, just how this is being perceived in terms of U.S. foreign policy. And, and one thing that we've seen really is something we don't see a ton of, which is, at least in the first year, a pretty unmitigated U.S. foreign policy success. Um, as you pointed out, um, a lot of people, including me, were, were very uh, bleak on the outcomes early on. Um, it looked like the U.S. support would probably help a bit, but Russia had a huge advantage, um, and their victory looked inevitable within months, if not weeks. 
Uh, but Ukraine has fought better, Russia worse, and the U.S. intervention um, has proven sustained um, and played a pretty important role here. Um, that, invent, uh, that, that U.S. intervention has come in the form of humanitarian assistance, budgetary aid, uh, military uh, weapons and training to the tune of something like $77 billion, I believe, in the first year. Um, I, I saw the statistic, I want to get it right. I believe last year was the first year that the number one beneficiary of U.S. foreign aid was a European country uh, since the Marshall Plan. Um, so Biden has committed not just funds and equipment, but he's also been managing a pretty challenging uh, international coalition on this, um, trying to balance a number of things, including uh, European challenges with less Russian oil, trying not to antagonize Russia and China so much as to in, in, invoke a, a bigger military response, uh, dealing with election in his own country. Um, if you saw Biden's uh, recent speech in Warsaw, he said, uh, quote, Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia, unquote, which in some way that's kind of his Ich bin ein Berliner moment. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's no, no president really ever expects to lose, but for him to state this very bluntly on TV in Eastern Europe, um, is to really stake a lot of his reputation on it. Now, at least until now, um, there's been a fair amount, a pretty striking amount of bipartisanship on this within the US. Um, there is an anti-war left. They have, uh, for the most part, not been particularly vocal on this. Um, Democratic Party leaders have been very strongly in favor of defending Ukraine. Um, Republican leaders in the House and Senate, if you think Speaker McCarthy, uh, Senate Minority Leader, McConnell have also struck very strong uh, anti-Russia stances. Um, Lindsey Graham has praised Joe Biden on this. All this is going on despite um, former President Trump being out there um, repeatedly calling for the war to end, calling for Russia to be appeased, and so forth. Now, this, this may be shifting slowly, subtly. Um, and it's important here to think about what we saw two months ago when Kevin McCarthy was trying to become a uh, speaker. Um, that was a very drawn out process, and there, there's a link here, I'm gonna get to this. Um, there is a faction of the Republican Party that leans toward Russia on this. Um, this isn't new. Uh, within the sort of Trumpist, Christian nationalist uh, wing of the party, Putin's Russia is something of a hero. Um, it exemplifies sort of raw authoritarian strength, a pushback against multiculturalism. It's the sort of leader Trump has aspired to be. Whatever woke is, Russia is the opposite of that, like even more so than Florida. Um, and uh, and then there's at least some Republicans in Congress who are strongly supportive of Russia as a result of that. They've been accusing Ukraine of all sorts of corruption and bigotry, and they're calling for an end to US military support. Um, these are a lot of the same folks that refuse to vote for Kevin McCarthy as speaker. Okay, it's a it's a wing of the party. It's a minority within the party. Um, but if it comes and if it comes down to just a straight up budget vote, the pro Ukraine side probably has the numbers. Um, but then there's a question of would Speaker McCarthy even let such a vote on the floor? Um, it's important to remember that to become speaker, he gave up a lot of power to that faction. Okay, so they have some leverage over him. His speakership kind of always hangs by a thread on this. Now. Uh, one of the people of this faction, uh, Florida's uh, Representative Matt Gates, um, he has been uh, circulating a bill recently declaring what he calls congressional fatigue on Ukraine. Uh, it would severely curtail Ukraine aid if it passed. Um, Speaker McCarthy says he does not support this bill, but he's also now saying he won't sign a blank check on Ukraine aid either. He wants there to be greater oversight, um, if not a reduction in funding. Um, so he's trying to walk a fairly delicate line on this. Um, it's interestingly, we've also seen this play out to some extent in the very early uh, presidential nomination contest on the Republican side, where Trump is, of course, a candidate. He's staked out a, a somewhat pro-Russia side. And one of the few areas where he's been challenged uh, by Nikki Haley and other Republican candidates is on, uh, on Ukraine. Um, so we may be seeing that play out as one of the bigger divisions in that, in that contest. Uh, I just want to briefly touch on public opinion, um, which has been shifting somewhat. A year ago, um, the American people were almost unanimously um, supportive of, of Ukraine in this contest, uh, conflict, excuse me. Um, there was a poll about a year ago uh, showed 5% of Democrats uh, and 9% of Republicans saying we were doing too much for Ukraine, okay? Very small percentages in both parties saying we were doing too much. Uh, the most recent version of that poll had 15% of Democrats saying we were doing too much for Ukraine, 
40% of Republicans saying that. So there, there are growing divisions there. Part of that is people responding to what their party leaders are saying. Part of that is just sort of, you know, the inevitable fatigue that occurs over time with an overseas military commitment. Um, we've seen in other conflicts, uh, presidential commitment can last longer than public opinion, but not forever. Um, so it's uh, honestly, it's hard to see how, you know, where this goes from here. Uh, this can last a while, um, but at least from the US perspective, it cannot go on forever. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Um, I just want to start my comments, which I've asked, I've been asked to speak on the gender dimensions of the war. And I just want to start um, by taking a moment to reflect on the catastrophic human cost of this war and the ways that so many people around the world are feeling um, the harms in their bodies and their families and their communities and their loved ones' lives. Um, I've spent my career studying women in war, and I can tell you that the moments of war that people live through are not the stop or the, 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 the kind of the, the start or the end of the way in which war shapes people's lives. It stays with you forever, um, oftentimes through generations. Um, and so I think it's important every time we're talking about this war to really reflect on the sheer scale of human suffering that it's um, produced. I was sitting uh, here uh, uh, in Denver a year ago when the invasion started and had three conversations with three different people in my life that were directly affected. Um, one, my father's wife, of all people, who was born in Kyiv as a Russian, whose twin sister lives in Moscow, and who was watching the, the division between her community in Ukraine and her family um, back in Moscow, and was also dealing with the reports um, that her parents were articulating that there were Nazis in Ukraine. And so trying to make sense of this um, from a very kind of human perspective where she was hearing this from her family and wondering you know, how, how this was possible. Um, and the fear and the suffering and the sadness that really were uh, present in those conversations I had with her stick with me to this day in terms of remembering the human beings that are on the ground here. The second conversation was with my research associate who I've been working with for the last six years, who um, was based in Kyiv and happened to have joint citizenship between the Ukraine um, and the US. He was running a large operation in Kyiv and uh, was the only man of all the people in his co uh, company who had dual citizenship. So that meant that he was the only man that was possible that was able to leave the country and he ended up shepherding about 30 to 35 women and children across the border into Poland, I believe they ended up um, finding their way to um, outside of Poland. Um, uh, and the WhatsApp messages and the calls uh, that I was getting from him were so distressing and they were um, uh, deeply unsettling and they would come in at all times times of the night and what he was asking for was work he was trying to find work that he could get the university of denver to actually contract with his team back in kiev that were trying to make sure they could keep the lights on in their office they were doing a dating my data mining operation there um, using basically doing social science research for people like myself um, uh, harvesting data from twitter and they wanted contracts to be able to keep going and they needed to be able to keep going because it was costing so much money to get all of the women and children across the borders. The third conversation was with a, a dear friend, Natalia, who came to Denver a couple years ago as part of the Inclusive Global Leadership Initiative that we run here out of the Corbell School, which uh, elevates and amplifies the work of women identified activists. And Natalia is the um, head of the Ukraine Women's Foundation, and she had been really, really involved in the Euromaidan protests in, in, in Ukraine. And so what Natalia was talking about was whether she should stay, whether she should go, what the role was going to be for feminist activists in this war. And in the first few weeks, it was very, um, in some ways, very encouraging. There was a lot of civil resistance, a lot of people um, actually confronting Russian troops with their bodies and with flowers and with these very creative ways of resisting the war. Um, and as the year has gone on, it's been really difficult to watch that work really, really change and get much um, more serious and also for her to face many losses of those that were uh, initially very active in the resistance. So I've been at all three of those 
people <laughs> that, that reminded me of the human cost of the war here and the people that are affected also reminded me of the, of the truism that all war is gendered, and this one is no exception. Wars are gendered in terms of how they are justified, how they are fought, how they are experienced in the bodies of those affected, and they are also gendered in terms of their long-term effects, who flees, who fights, who is resettled, who struggles. From the very beginning of this war, Putin's justifications for the invasion of Ukraine were deeply gendered. They re reflected the machismo of the Russian people, the kind of need to preserve traditional family values, the disdain of Western influence that was blurring the gender binary. All of these were very explicit reasons for Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Putin is on record feminizing Zelensky using a f feminine kind of um, language, right, to talk about Zelensky. And as the war got underway, we can understand how this deeply patriarchal machismo has really shaped the parameters and the unfolding of the war, particularly in terms of the way in which much um, of the areas in which Russian troops have occupied have been sites of tremendous and horrific sexual violence. We see how it's played out in brutality, this um, uh, assertion of particular masculine identities over subordinated feminine identities, or even what we call as feminist scholars, subordinated masculinities as well. This idea of Ukrainians as weaker than Russians. We see it playing out in rape and forced nudity, not only of women, but also of men, and in so many other uh, dynamics. I want to highlight three uh, to, to kind of focus my own comments today. The first is, as I've mentioned, the pervasive use of sexual violence in this war. Um, I think it's in incumbent on all of us to know uh, that sexual violence isn't something just targeting women, but in the case of Ukraine, we've seen uh, children as young as four and people as old as 82 being documented as having been raped um, and abused in many ways by Russian forces. These are also not just women, they are men, they are boys, um, and I think that it's very, it's going to be a long road to figure out how we address this um, in the post-war reconstruction process and injustice processes. One of the challenges in Ukraine is that there's a deep distrust of authorities providing services in the, in the kind of extension of care for people that have lived through sexualized violence. Um, and so we know that many people are afraid to report what they've experienced for fear of being labeled somebody who has fraternized with the enemy, um, and also the tremendous social stigma that results from sexualized violence during war. It's also important to note that these uh, tactics are not um, uh, one-off events, they're not um, uh, a, a way of having the spoils of war, but they are deliberately part of Russian military strategy. And that, mu that military strategy is very similar as military strategies we've seen throughout the 20th century, including um, recently in Bosnia, a place I've done a lot of work where sexual violence is used as a tactic of ethnic cleansing. It happens on a, a pattern where we see troops arriving in a village or a town um, killing a targeted number of men, and then uh, proceeding with a campaign of sexual violence and rape, which is designed to force people into flight. I want to highlight one second point, which is the gendered politics of flight. There's been about 8 million people that have crossed Ukraine's borders into other parts of Europe and elsewhere in the world. Not about 90% of these are women and children as a result of forced conscription by Russian, uh, or sorry, by of Ukrainian men, um, which has prevented men from crossing the border. And I'll wrap up here quickly by just saying that I want to highlight one other vulnerability that I think is very important, which is that um, sexual and gender minorities, in particular, tr particularly trans women trying to leave Ukraine, have been prevented from being able to leave um, because the, the, the sex marker on their passports oftentimes identifies them as male. And this is a huge issue. This is a massive problem where a lot of people that are fully transitioned and living their lives as women are being uh, set, sent back to fight, opening them up to new forms of gendered insecurity and harm as they've been pushed back into the Ukrainian military. Um, I only got to two, but I'm out of time. So I have one more that might end up coming out in the Q&A, but I just want to thank you um, for listening to that. Thank you, Marie. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I am going to shift perspectives to talk about how Ukraine has attempted to manage global public opinion. And 
that's a big topic, so I will only focus on a few highlights as well, and hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. Um, it's no secret to anyone that this is probably the first war that is being fought um, in the context of a globally networked participatory media environment with social media allowing a lot of different actors to put out different narratives about the war, including the Ukrainian government, um, which has been able to reach out to various publics around the world. And so my focus is on this kind of public diplomacy that the Ukrainian government is doing, not the uh, backstage diplomatic conversations that might be happening. And there are three stages in which this public diplomacy has unfolded so far as I see it. And I agree that we don't know the end of the story yet, so it will keep changing. The first stage uh, happened immediately after the beginning of the war when the task from a communications perspective was to define what are the stakes of this conflict. And in, in this stage, Ukraine was very quick to frame the conflict very similarly to the way President Biden has been framing it as a conflict between democracy and authoritarianism or freedom and tyranny. This was a clever strategy at the time because it really resonated and brought back associations with the Cold War. This was a familiar narrative that immediately rang a lot of bells in the Western world. The trouble with this strategy over the long haul is that it's not really resonating with the global south and including some of the countries even in Eastern Europe. So that's a challenge that Ukraine will have to address over the long haul. In the second phase, um, once it was clear that the war is not going to be over in just a few weeks, uh, the main challenge became how do we keep this war relevant? How do we keep it in the media and in the public eye? Uh, given that there are a lot of other um, armed conflicts, but also other types of disasters all around the world, including recently earthquakes um, and, and many other conflicts. Um, and the typical way that this is done in the context of war is by trying to get reporters to cover the war. And of course, Ukraine is doing that and it's been enabling Western media to go in and cover the war. But what's been really interesting and innovative in this war is that Ukraine, knowing that its primary audience is in the Western world and that's where it would get its support, has also tried to tap into a popular culture um, discourse that can make this war relevant even to people who are not really tuned into the news. And they've done this in two ways. They've tried to turn the war into a spectacle and they've also tried to commodify the war. What do I mean by that? Um, so there's a lot of innovative uh, communication strategies they've adopted uh, that include partnering with Hollywood celebrities, for example, um, tapping into popular uh, movie narratives. Um, for example, right around the one year anniversary, the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine released a short video summarizing the war um, in 60 seconds where they were kind of presenting Ukraine as Batman fighting against evil. Or uh, Mark Hamill, the famous actor, um, dressed as Luke Skywalker, posting memes on social media, trying to fundraise for drones for Ukraine. So these are kind of tropes that um, can be recognized by the average person, even if they're not necessarily following geopolitical issues and, and paying much attention to the news. The merchandising part um, has been also quite interesting. Uh, shortly after the war, Ukraine established an organization called Brand Ukraine, which coordinates strategic messaging for all of these public diplomacy efforts. And it also started a shopping portal online called Made with Bravery, which allows people from all around the world to buy product made by Ukrainian manufacturers. And they actually do ship them all around the world. And they've developed logos and t-shirts and caps and so on and so forth as a way again to tap into this consumerist mentality that's become so common in the Western world and that we sort of associate with any kind of fundraising or uh, nonprofit engagement. Um, and finally, um, along the same lines, Ukraine has been very active in reaching out directly to the C CEOs of large companies and corporations. On the one hand, uh, lobbying, they pull their business out of Russia uh, as a punitive step. But on the other hand, also asking for direct help. 
And probably the most prominent and controversial example was when uh, a Ukrainian minister reached out directly to Elon Musk over Twitter, asking Musk to provide Ukraine with Starlink services so that they can maintain their internet capabilities, which are also essential to their military capabilities. And that has not been an uncomplicated relationship, but I'm not going to go into a discussion of that right now. But it also kind of um, illustrates the power of private business and of private money in this conflict to an extent that we haven't really seen in the past. And so finally, um, what's ahead, right? So we're trying to reflect on what's ahead one year later. There are some new challenges that I see emerging for Ukraine. Um, that they will have to address not only through communication, through other means as well, but I'll just touch on the communication side. So at this point, um, from a strategic point of view, the problem is how do we define victory? And that is something that nobody yet has articulated, and um, Ukraine will have to find a way. They've started putting out different narratives that are supposed to signal what victory means to them. Um, it's not really congealed into a coherent message, and it hasn't, it's not really uh, taken a form that will appeal to all of its allies. Um, secondly, uh, they do have the challenge of keeping Western public opinion engaged and on their side, as Seth point, pointed out, there's been some slide downwards there. Um, a third very important challenge is given all the aid that has been sent to Ukraine, Ukraine has to maintain a reputation for transparency and for ethical appropriation of these funds. Any hint of corruption uh, will damage their efforts to get continued support, uh, and they do have uh, that reputation prior to the war. So that's something that the Zelensky government will really have to watch for. And finally, um, in the context of all of this, Ukraine also has to think of ways to find common ground with the rest of the world, and especially uh, Brazil, India, China, and South Africa, the large um, countries that have more or less implicitly allied with Russia and who are in a position to really offset the global balance. Um, so I'm going to piggyback off of what Nadia just mentioned. Um, we, for the most part, I think we live in a bubble. Um, that is, you know, the politicians and their rhetoric contributes to that. The media, the international media contributes to that. But in other parts of the world, what is being heard is totally different. Um, so I'm going to be talking about RT. And RT is one of the main Russian media arms, the far reaching of which actually globally. Um, just quick facts about RT. RT started in 2005 as Russia Today. A few years later, they changed their name to RT. We can only guess why. Um, and basically, they produce content in Russian, of course, but also in English, French, German, Spanish, Arabic. And just a few months ago, they started the Serbian language as well. So um, there have been restrictions on RT from the US and from the EU. But of course, that decreased the viewership, but they are still up and running, even in EU countries. Matter of fact, EU satellite providers, some of them are actually still carrying RT and other Russian media outlets. Um, RT has been, you know, nimble in putting their content out there, you know, sidestepping certain restrictions on YouTube. So now they are on Rumble, um, fully live streaming since March with over 12 million views. They are up on Odyssey, another platform. They are up on Telegram. They are up on Instagram. They are up on many other platforms. Then the question then becomes, so what? The so what here comes in two prongs. One is content. So the content of RT, as you can imagine, presents the West as hypocritical, undermines Western politicians, and it also presents um, sort of like a um, heroic image of Russia, as you can imagine. Then the impact is, and those are empirical studies that have found that watching RT and consuming its content actually leads to undermining support to the world order, 
it also creates from 10 to 20 points drop in perception of US as a country and as a global leader. Um, and it also decreases support for Ukraine. So as you can imagine here, we're talking about the West, what is happening in the other parts of the world and the Arab world is part of it that I'm going to be focusing on here. The Arab world has over 430 million people across 22 countries in a very strategic part of the world, geopolitically speaking. Um, RT Arabic actually has the highest number of followers across the RT branded channels. Um, and they have the second highest number of posts over the past year after RT Spanish which is actually another conversation to have how they are targeting Latin American countries in a very similar way as they are targeting the Arab world. So I'm working with uh, colleagues here across the US and we are working on a grant to understand Russian media and Chinese media. So something that we've done is actually comparing the languages and how the content strategies differ because as you can imagine there's not a lot of work done on stuff other than you know, um, French, uh, German, but mainly English. So one of the interesting things that we found is that the way that RT bashes on Western countries and their platforms and their different um, websites, etc., is basically non-existent in the Arabic channel. Why? Because mainly they talk about certain things that relate to population control. They talk about gender equality. They talk about abortion. They talk about gun control. They talk about a lot of those stuff. And many of those are already taboos in many of the Arab countries. So they are basically non-existent. The second thing is when it comes to also the representation or the framing of states as failing, actually the failing states are almost always US, France, Germany and um, European countries. In fact, they do not only stay silent on issues that are happening in the Arab world, they actually glamorize Arab leaders, which actually helps and catalyze their presence and they're able to sustain their operations in those countries. The other thing that was very interesting, especially given my research in the area of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and their media campaigns, is actually an interesting similarity between RT and ISIS and the way they present their content or themselves also as an authority when it comes to science, an authority when it comes to giving health tips, as an authority when it comes to giving technological tips, how to evade certain restrictions online, etc. So in a way they become the go-to source in order to how to have a diet how to deal with diabetes, how to, you know, upgrade your phone, etc. And ISIS did similar stuff. They actually had infographics on blood donations. They had stuff about how to, um, you know, pre precautions when the swine flu was happening, etc. The question then becomes, how does this relate to Ukraine? And what is happening here is that by building credibility, so let me backtrack here for a second the percentage of posts that talk about Ukraine and RT Arabic are actually not that much. But when they happen, they are actually having very interesting content in there. So by building credibility in other facets, when, whether it's health, whether it's technology, whether it, it is anything, they're essentially trying to pinpoint and to sharpen the effectiveness of their arguments. I've seen on RT Arabic them calling Kyiv a Russian city. I've seen on RT uh, videos showing how you, uh, Russia is basically the humanitarian champion that is going there to defend the people who are under the mercy of neo-Nazis in Ukraine. And the interesting thing here is that I've also heard in personal conversations with Arab friends and Arab family members, etc., talking about how, you know, hey, Russia is just defending itself. Russia is just helping the people who are out there. So I guess what I'm trying to say here um, to wrap up is that yes, the war has gone for one year and we're calling it now prolonged war, mainly because the expectations was that this is a war that can end rather quick. 
but the media war is ongoing and has been ongoing since 2005, at least in the context of RT operations, but in other, other Russian media outlets as well. And it's not going to stop once the war stops. So this is something to think of. So first, thank you all. Um, we've heard a robust set of really thoughtful, wide-ranging um, comments, assessments, analyses, as well as some uh, key things to think about uh, as we look um, you know, towards the next stages. So at this point, I'd love to invite um, those of us joining in person and also online uh, to um, come up or type in uh, with questions that you have. And we will have a microphone for the, again, for those who are in person to make sure that everybody who's online is able to hear. Uh, and then I think we have someone yep, coming up uh, when we have questions and I'll read them out if they're questions coming from our online audience so that everyone can hear them. So why don't I start with, um, I'm not sure there's a question in here, uh, but this is so very academic, um, which is so great. Uh, so why don't we, um, if you are interested in asking a question and you're in person, that would be great. Um, and then I'm going to try and turn this into a question. Um, I think these are different notes maybe, uh, but so great. It sounds like there's a liveliness uh, in the online audience as well. And so I think this one may be more of a specific question for those of you who talked about um, the negotiation question. Maybe this is also Nadia from that perspective. And so I think the question here might be about the um, opportunities or the pluses and minuses, let's say, of waiting until there are some clear concrete gains in the war um, before trying to make negotiations. So maybe what's the strategy on that and what are the pluses and minuses of doing so? So I think the first thing to state is that nobody wants to negotiate right now. And that's unfortunate for lots of reasons, but both sides still think they can win. And there's very little logic to negotiating if you think you can win. Um, even if you are, and I think Vladimir Putin has shown some indications he's open to negotiations recently. I think there's been some statements made that were clearly intended to signal that I'd be willing to have a negotiation. I'm not saying he would make any concessions, but I think there's reasons he'd like to appear to be willing. Um, I think you don't come up with a Chinese negotiation plan unless Vladimir Putin was aware that was going to happen. Um, you don't accuse Joe Biden of going to Kiev and trying to make the Ukrainians negotiate unless you're indicating you're prepared to have some sort of negotiation. But Russia wants to negotiate after it has demonstrated that it, it can continue to threaten Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine doesn't want to negotiate at the moment because they're reasonably sure they will wear Russia down and be in a better position at the end of this campaign uh, if all goes well. Either side could get that wrong. Um, either side could change their mind about the value of negotiations fairly quickly. But at the moment, unfortunately, uh, from those I talk to and the analysis I've seen, um, everybody's going to play out the spring offensive and the spring counteroffensive, and there's going to be a spring counteroffensive if this goes the way the Ukrainians want. Uh, you don't round up all those things with wheels and guns that move quickly uh, unless you're planning on using them in one of two ways, and both of them involve blunting Russian action and taking territory back. To, to Nadia's very important point, I don't think the Ukrainians negotiate, and then I'll let her talk about it because it's her point. Um, I don't think the Ukrainians negotiate until they figure out what is a reasonable expectation for a commitment they can make. Um, they floated the Crimea piece and they got a reaction they weren't thrilled with, um, which was basically various Western countries going, mm, no. Um, uh, so there's a question on the Ukrainian side about what they think they would negotiate for. And there's a question on the Russian side of when to negotiate. And in the short run, I think you're talking about a post-spring campaign, post-spring counter-campaign problem, sadly. I, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. So I, as I understand the question, it was, is there an advantage to waiting on negotiations until there are tangible gains on the battlefield? And all I'm gonna say about this is that how tangible gains on the battlefield are defined is an open-ended question, and that is part of the communication and propaganda war. And I was going to add to that. 
I can declare victory at any point. Vladimir Putin could declare victory is securing a commitment to get Crimea, which, by the way, was floated recently by some Russian commentators, uh, was that it would be acceptable to just get Crimea permanently included, or I could declare victory as getting Crimea and a pledge that Ukraine can't join NATO, or I could draw a line here. The, as I tell my students, some of which are in the room, everything about war is subjective and is political. Vladimir Putin could declare victory at any point he thinks he could sell that. The question is, when is that point? Hi, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciated all the perspectives, especially Marie, your, your, the human reminding us of the human suffering was very impactful. Um, I have a question that's possibly for Nadia or Karim, but maybe anyone knows the answer. Um, it would be great to hear what the U.S. is doing propaganda-wise, because we know that there's also, the U.S. is also in this game, and I don't know, I know that hasn't been the focus of your research, but I'm wondering if you've come across um, any innovations or interesting research um, in that era, in that area. So I haven't done research on that in particular, but I've done research on Voice of America. And what I can say is that, and here I'm comparing Voice of America to its own mission at propagating the you know, foreign policy of, of the US, it's very incoherent. Um, I haven't looked at how they are doing it in Ukraine, but I've, I've done research on how they were framing COVID in general. It was very incoherent. And the other thing is, compared to other media, whether it's Russian media or Chinese media, they are pouring in resources much more than the US in those operations. Just to give you a quick example, photographs that are put out there by Chinua Agency, for example, from China, are for the most part original photographs that are being you know, shot by photojournalists on the ground. Voice of America, they just pull images from AP, AFP, Reuters. So there's little wiggle room here at how they are putting their message. I think though that the US, it's leverage, it's not necessarily in the news media aspect as much as in the popular culture. So I can add a little bit to this, although again, I, I have not done a specific study on that, but what I've observed uh, just kind of anecdotally is basically two things. One is the, the individual involvement of celebrities, which I mentioned, right? And that's been very active. And in fact, on the anniversary of the start of the invasion, the Ukrainian government released a video to its own population with Ukrainian subtitles where they had a montage of maybe 15 uh, or 20 uh, Hollywood celebrities telling Ukraine that we love you and we support you and so on and so forth. Uh, and so that's been very visible in public. But in terms of what the government is doing, the US government, um, I think the participation has not been so much in putting out an active narrative as much as providing background support to Ukraine and building up capacity for information, uh, content creation, dissemination, vetting, and so on and so forth. And that's not a new effort. That started back in 2014 after the annexation of Crimea when it was very obvious that Ukraine was not prepared for that and did not know how to respond, not just militarily, but also informationally. And so at that point, a lot of organizations were created on the ground in Ukraine that have been funded by the US government, Department of State, and so on, to build that kind of capacity. And the current informational offensive of Ukraine kind of demonstrates how successful those efforts have been. Something very quick to add here, is that the US, unfortunately, it has presidents where its um, media campaigns, rather, um, are very overly simplistic in a way. And I'm here, I'm talking about the example just a few years ago with ISIS, where they put the State Department put an entire campaign that all what it was saying is they are evil. And all what it was doing is actually repurposing and repackaging ISIS videos. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is um, any intervention or any media campaign needs to be very culturally sensitive and nuanced in that sense, beyond just the notion that Russia is evil. So, 
And I now have a couple of questions from the um, our, our audience online. So I'll ask one, and then if we have um, other ones we can interweave from our in-person audience, great. If not, I have some more. Uh, but this one is someone who would love to hear um, Marie be able to make her third point. So uh, we'd love to hear that. <laughs> Well, bad news, I actually had two more points, but I, I was sort of, I mean, thanks uh, for that. I, I, the, the third point I was gonna make was about the gendered politics of actually fighting the war. And I, and, I, and I wanted to say two things. I think particularly at the beginning of the war, there was this sense that the Ukrainian military was sort of a um, gender equal and very um, progressive fighting force. And, and a lot of the, and I just, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that's absolutely not the case. Um, there were a lot of uh, officials on record saying there were 20% women in the fighting uh, troops. And what we learned um, over the course of several investigations was that that really wasn't true. And a lot of the women that were in the fighting forces were experiencing a lot of forms of discrimination and harassment um, actually from the Ukrainian soldiers. And so just complicating that, uh, that idea um, that the that the military is somehow this kind of route towards this or, or is a beacon of kind of feminist or liberal progressive values i think is important but the second point related to that um was that um i i would i would just i wanted to make a pitch to really um uh, trouble this distinction that you hear in the media a lot between civilian and um, combatant deaths um, we oftentimes, especially this last week, it was this many um, civilians and maybe this many combatants. And I think there, you know, one of the, the gendered ways in which this language kind of is created is that oftentimes we see civilians as women and children and we kind of lump them together and then we think of combatants as men. And I, I, I think in this case and, and really in, in almost all wars <laughs> in, in the 21st century, certainly, and, and, and in the latter half of the 20th century, the line between combatants and civilians is one that deserves to be troubled. Um, we know that a lot of the Russian troops are forcibly uh, conscripted. They are prisoners that are be sent, being sent to the front lines. We know that on the Ukrainian side, men are being um, forced to fight. And of course, a lot of the um, you know, media representation that we see is a, a lot of kind of people wanting to do this and a lot of nationalism and nationalist pride in that fight. But I would just um, urge some, uh, some, some caution every time we see civilian deaths as somehow less grievable than, um, or I'm sorry, combatant deaths as quote unquote less grievable to use Judith Butler's term um, than civilian deaths and to really um, think about the, the full kind of complex human suffering that is resulting from this war um, that's, that's felt by, by, by many quote unquote combatants as well. Um, that fourth point, I, I'm not gonna, I'll skip that fourth point. That's good. I, I, I just wanted to say one little thing, which is that one of the things that's given me some hope about the gender dimensions of the war. I mean, at the beginning, I mentioned my my colleague and friend who was um, very involved with a lot of the initial resistance. You remember the women woman facing the Russian troops with a flower and this kind of this 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 really um, po these powerful images coming out of resistance and and to an extent some of that I think has faded from the media it's faded from the front pages but what we know and what a lot of feminist networks and feminist groups are talking about is that this is still happening um, and it's happening oftentimes in much more informal private spaces than in public spaces but that this resistance is very very vibrant um, and I was I've been um, kind of in awe of some of these collectives that have formed in places like Kiev, but also places even in Bucha places that have experienced horrific uh, uh, occupation, if you will, um, feminist uh, collectives that have uh, created uh, entire sort of new communes within apartment buildings where people have been invited to come, and especially if they've been subjected to forms of uh, horrific sexual or sexualized torture, have found safe spaces to be able to heal from that, to be able to find food, to be able to find community. Um, and it just, to me, reminds me always that the creativity and kind of a politics of, of community and of, and of care exists simultaneously to the politics of destruction. And, and, and the horrors of violence, um, and to always look for those stories. Um, and so that was my third point, 3.2, 3.5 point. So if you have a question in person, do you have the microphone? Awesome, great. Um, first of all, panelists, thank you for your time. Uh, my question, I think, is primarily directed for uh, Dr. Maskett. 
Um, so we've kind of gotten an idea of how far Putin is willing to go because he's really risked his uh, political future on this operation, especially Crimea. Um, I guess my question is, Biden is taking a big chance. President Biden is taking a huge chance with this operation, has received a lot of criticism. Um, so my question is, how much is his political future and his party's political future um, staked on the war? And I guess how far, especially with the presidential election coming up in a little over a year, um, how far do you think that he is willing to go um, to achieve success in Ukraine? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, what, what the outcomes actually look like. Um, you know, if, if, you, if somehow Ukraine suffers a, you know, a complete and humiliating loss um, and is essentially, you know, completely taken over, occupied by Russia, um, yes, that would be seen as a, you know, a huge failure um, uh, on, you know, for, for U.S. intervention. Um, Biden, I'm sure, would be angry about it. There would be there would be some implication in U.S. politics, but still probably not enormous. Um, it's rare that um, foreign policy plays an enormous role in U.S. elections, at least, you know, since the Cold War came to an end. Um, so I think it would sort of depend on the timing. It would depend on sort of what loss or victory looks like. Um, I could imagine it playing out more as a feature in um, Republican nomination politics on the presidential side rather than as a, a major thing in the presidential election itself. Um, there's also the feature, I mean, if, if we think about what, you know, think of like the last 20 years of, of U.S. foreign policy with regards to, say, Iraq and Afghanistan, where, um, you know, what, what looked like a very long, you know, a, a prolonged and ultimately not very successful U.S. intervention um, didn't end up playing that large a role in presidential election politics, with the exception probably of 2004. Um, it never really seemed to uh, hurt Obama all that much. It never really seemed to hurt Trump all that much. Um, the only person it hurt was Biden when he ended it. Um, and so I'm sure he's cognizant of that. And I, I think, you know, doesn't, doesn't want to be seen as, as the president who pulled out too quickly or anything like that. Um, but there's, there's a lot of ways this can play out. I, I end up thinking it won't play an enormous role in, um, uh, within U.S. presidential elections, unless there's a really unusual and dramatic um, outcome shortly before an election. Um, I think that that's unlikely, but not impossible. So I'm going to take a question from the chat now. Um, this one, I think actually a number of you might want to touch on different aspects of it. So the specific question is, what is the stance of Israel on Ukraine and what does RT say on this subject? I think we also can imagine expanding that to elsewhere in the Middle East. Obviously, Syria has had its own take on Ukraine. Um, and then we've seen some really interesting movement from the Gulf recently as well, which I think gets to some of your points about the, the question of adjustment, but may also touch on US policy and also on some uh, branding and communications issues. So I guess I'm gonna get us started on the media aspect. Um, so, so one thing, one thing uh, that that has popped up in RT when it comes to Israel in general is mainly just the Abraham Abraham uh, Accords uh, negotiations and stuff. Just by virtue of this being newsworthy to an Arab audience, and that doesn't really factor much actually in the other. Um, languages, English, French, German, Spanish, um, I'm pretty sure Serbian as well. Um, but the other thing that I've, that I've seen in terms of conversations, just conversations outside RT in general, is basically digging back at Zelensky's own uh, position when it comes to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and trying to foreground that to the front to point out that, hey, are you really fe feeling sorry for Ukraine? Do you know what Ukraine did for Palestine? Let me tell you. So this is something that I've seen on social media as posts as, um, and basically as rhetoric or narratives that are being uh, put out there. Yeah, this is, this is a tough one. I guess we should start with Israel's a little busy at the moment. Um, and, and so, I mean, they're having a very serious constitutional crisis that is sucking justifiably the, all the oxygen out of the Israeli political debate and everything has become about where you stand on the Supreme Court process. Um, the other tricky part about answering a question about Israel at the moment is Netanyahu. Um, 
who is a brilliant political tactician, whether you support or agree with any of his views or values, but moves around a lot. Um, and so is very good at taking sort of non-position, middle positions. The general Israeli view has been um, that there's a dispute that should be resolved, and it's sort of a lasting legacy of the post-Cold War. When Netanyahu was dealing with Trump, there was a sort of pro-Russian tint to the conversation uh, that you would expect from two people who got along very well. Um, he doesn't enjoy Biden's company. He and Biden are not collegial. And so the official Israeli position has been generally to be really quiet on the question of Ukraine. Um, and that's even pre-Supreme Court crisis. Um, you're not going to see Israeli military defense officials get up and say nice things about the invasion of the Ukraine. They're very aware who their leading ally is. They're very aware who their colleagues are that provide an enormous amount of interactive intelligence and, and support. Um, at the same time, you haven't seen statements from the Israeli government that you might have seen under different leaders in different contexts simply denouncing the role of force. You could see Israel playing the, as a country threatened by other countries that would invade us, we are going to get on board the global norm of non-intervention. But that is so not part of the Netanyahu package um, that I think you've just sort of gotten this muddled uh, sort of, that's unfortunate, um, that really hasn't developed in anything I could point to. Over, over here. Um, I was wondering, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, U.S. support for the war in Ukraine is kind of starting to fade along party lines, and we're not the only ones to notice this. And I was wondering if the panel perhaps could speak to how other nations and actors are viewing this trend. So, for instance, how RT is portraying this message, or, for instance, how people like China may be responding to this. And I hope. I could do China, I can't do RT yet. The RT expert's over there. Um, I'll, I'll do, so China is interesting, and I mentioned it earlier, so I'll, I'll flesh that out quickly. Um, China was misquoted, interestingly. China said something, something very insightful at the very beginning of this war, and I think we misunder, and misinterpreted it. Um, China said, Taiwan is not Ukraine. Uh, and everybody interpreted that as somehow whatever goes on in Ukraine will have no bearing on how we view an invasion of Taiwan. That is not what they meant. Um, what they meant was China has a long-standing policy against military intervention. Actually, China is a, is a UN charter member uh, paragon of non-intervention for all kinds of historical reasons. What they said was, well, no, invading another country is a terrible thing, and we, we don't support that. But since Taiwan's in our country, this has no bearing on us whatsoever. And, and that was completely misunderstood as somehow this was some sort of calculated political statement. This was, I'm sorry about that. What's it got to do with us? Um, and they largely all the sort of shadow closet, I mean, they've, they've clearly, and I'm, I'm a little leery of this. I think it's a Western perspective to go, they're in the Russian camp until recently. I think what they were was they weren't in anybody's camp particularly, and we just assumed they should have been in our camp, and because they weren't by default, they were pro-Russian. They were pro-Chinese. They were pro-chances to buy oil at lower costs. They were pro-ability to fund things in Russia that they previously didn't have market access to. They were opportunistic. Um, more than I think there was some calculated pro-Russian agenda beyond, we don't disapprove of this. Um, that's changed. Um, where that's going is interesting. What China seems to have concluded is that if this war is going to go on, they're going to have to take a position whether they're in fact pro-Russian or not. And what they're attempting to do is be pro-global pro-Russian, meaning we're now going to start supporting Russia more overtly because we think the war is going on long enough that we have to pick who we want to have leverage with at the same time, we're gonna present things like negotiation plans, and we're gonna talk about being the place that would be able to hold a forum. And because we're neutrals and believers in non-intervention, the Ukrainians should be able to trust us to hold, a, hold, hold these meetings. But this is also just opportunism. This is just an answer to raise their profile in a situation which to them is largely just a win. Uh, the West is exerting an enormous amount of energy, Russia is exerting an enormous amount of energy, and China is being provided with opportunities. I don't know that it's any deeper than that. Yeah, and I mean, to, to piggyback again off of what 
was mentioned here is Russian media is just very consistent in the way they uh, present things about Russia. But other than that, studies have found that they engage in geopolitical culture jamming. They actually alternate positions between the right and the left. All what they care for is catering to audience. And as you can imagine, catering to a lot of youth by, you know, flipping and going back and forth between those talking points can actually get people on board. That is different from Chinese media. Chinese media, as you just mentioned, is actually parallel to the opportunistic narrative that is portrayed um, foreign policy-wise and political-wise. Matter of fact, they don't criticize anybody except the U.S. And Uncle Sam, they have that infatuation with political cartoons of Uncle Sam doing weird stuff on their media, <laughs> whether it's CGTN or Xinhua or CCTV, etc. But for the most part, they are mute on Ukraine. So we've had the suggestion um, from my colleagues up here to combine a few questions or to put a few questions together. Um, and so thank you colleagues on Zoom because you have delivered. Um, so I'll read some off and then we'll take a couple of in-person questions after that. And then I think we'll be at time. So the first question is, get ready. Can anyone speak to the humanitarian situation uh, with regard to family relations across the two countries and how this has affected the war? The next question is a question that could be about um, both the United States and NATO in terms of uh, addressing the question of NATO expansion and that's role in provoking uh, Russia's invasion, but also what elements of power, diplomatic, informational, or economic can the US or NATO bring to bear for this effort, including what would Russia view as crossing another red line? Um, and then uh, the final question is, and then again, after this round, we'll take in-person questions. How do you see the future of Ukraine after the war is over? What would recovery look like and what um, what uh, what would be Russia's fate if it loses? For example, would it exist within the 1991 borders? So humanitarian relations, uh, US NATO lovers slash what would be going too far? And then what might the future look like in terms of recovery for Ukraine and the future for Russia? I can quickly um, tell you that I don't think I have enough time to answer the question about humanitarian relations between Russia and Ukraine. I I think that I'll just flag a couple things, though. I mean, I think one, you know, many people with family in both places will tell you that this is, you know, more akin to Scotland and the UK than, you know, a lot of other places. And so it, it feels very personal and it feels very connected and it feels very heavy. <laughs> um, I think uh, most of my Russian friends and people I know in Russia are very, very worried about this. Um, and they're worried about they're sending their kids abroad if they can. They're terrified of conscription. They do not want, they do not support Putin, right? There's a lot of opposition in Russia. Um, of course, there's a lot of people who are supporting the, 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 the war as well and who see it as a legitimate, you know, way of rooting out um, all the things that have already been spoken about. Um, but I, I would just flag the second thing, which is that, you, you know, when you have 8 million people fleeing across the borders of a, of a state and including almost 2 million, I believe, in Russia, right, a lot of Ukrainian refugees have ended up in Russia, um, you, we, we're, we're going to see a lot of challenges to family dynamics and to um, uh, so many other things coming down the pipe, um, especially when it when we really kind of question what the what the time frame is for repatriation, if that is possible at some point in time, and um, areas of, of of Ukraine that of course come under Russia control or have been since 2012 and except and so on, um, we 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 see some really I think some really difficult decisions being made in terms of where people are going to stay. Um, so I just I keep coming back to the like. You know that I, my students have heard me say this 10 times in the last two weeks but that nobody leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark right this this um this this beautiful um poem and quote um and i and i think that's really really real and it's it's a lot of people that are fled are feeling the the kind of the the heaviness of that displacement so i guess i've got the nato stuff um let me see if i can do this simultaneously um we got asked this question a year ago, and I'm going to borrow a little bit from Rachel Epstein, Professor Rachel Epstein of Corbell's very good answer. Um, there's, there's no question that if you're Vladimir Putin, 
you can be provoked by the expansion of NATO. That isn't the same thing to say that countries that wanted to join NATO should not have been allowed to join NATO of their own free will. And, and there's a tendency, you're all familiar, maybe you're all familiar with John Mearsheimer and his argument that basically we started this war because we expanded NATO and we provoked the Russians. The assumption, that, and all due respect to John Mearsheimer, that makes it sound like we forced somebody at gunpoint to join NATO. And as Dr. Epstein's research has pointed out, almost all of these countries wanted to join NATO and were allowed to join NATO. So it's a slightly different twist. We would have had to say, no, we're more worried about Russian security concerns than we are about your joining us. And that just wasn't contextually logical at the time. Whether it, in retrospect, we want to argue that might have been a more sensible policy or we could have slow rolled it or we could have done more things to make the Russians comfortable. Okay, we could have an operational discussion about how that might have played out. But the idea that we we're going to turn down NATO memberships for countries in the 90s and early 2000s who really wanted to join and who made perfectly good sense because they were EU members or they were about to be EU members is just, with all due respect, John, just not, doesn't make a lot of sense. The flip side is I don't think NATO membership um, if for Finland or Sweden um, triggers is a red line. Um, I think Putin's surprised. I think Putin's dismayed. I, I don't think it's a, it's, a huge, it's a huge problem. The red lines fall in two categories. Um, and I think there are also red lines for some of our NATO allies, too. I mean, I think this is one in which they're probably not crossable, and you've seen that. Um, one is people on the ground. Um, when we train people for all this various equipment we're giving them, notice they're training elsewhere. Now, there are all sorts of economical and logical reasons for this to send them to Britain and train, send them to the United States and train, send them to Poland and train. First of all, the infrastructure is already there. You're out of a war zone. There are lots of reasons for this. The other reason is you don't have to deploy actual human beings from NATO militaries in the Ukraine. And I think that Putin has made very clear would be seen as an escalatory step that would validate the other pieces to the, our, our folks who are very savvy on messaging, would also validate Putin's argument that this is a war between NATO and Russia, and the Ukrainians just happen to be the place in which we're doing this. I don't think you'll see that because I think that is a red line. The other one, which I'm curious to watch, and then I'll, I'll shut up and stop hogging the time, airplanes. Um, there's a lot of complications. Tanks and airplanes look like similar systems with similar implications. They're very different systems with very different implications. And notice we're very hesitant to do airplanes. When the Ukrainians got the tanks, and they didn't get as many tanks as they think they're getting, and there's all sorts of details here, but when they got the tanks, they immediately moved on to, well, now to protect the tanks, we need airplanes. Notice how quickly the answer to that was, nope. What do you mean, next? Uh, there's really no traction outside of a couple NATO countries who float the trial balloon every so often, because Putin has made it very clear that that would be an escalatory step that he would respond to in certain ways he hasn't done yet. Um, uh, and I think that probably will be the interesting one. If things go badly for Ukraine and people's political stakes are involved in this, the one to watch is airplanes, um, because I think that's the indicator of whether this is going to be an expansion or an escalation, a vertical escalation of this conflict, or whether, in fact, this is going to be managed until some sort of resolution of, of negotiable solution takes place. I'll just very quickly address the question about post-war reconstruction. Uh, this is a huge game of speculation at this point, but two things to keep in mind. Number one, there's no po post-war reconstruction unless there are security guarantees for Ukraine. And what that looks like is as yet unclear, whether there will have to be some kind of a peacekeeping force on the ground, similar to what we've seen in the Balkans, or whether there will be some other kind of arrangement um, I'm not an expert on that, but that is step one before anything else. However, that said, there are already conversations going on uh, at the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, European Union, that are framed around the question of who will pay for what? Because there's an understanding that it'll be a huge reconstruction effort, infrastructure, industry, uh, various kinds of market opportunities as well. And the private sector is um, eager to jump in on this. There will be a lot of funds uh, that have been pledged for reconstruction efforts that will be dispersed. And so that will be a big uh, political battle, I think, and also will create a lot of potential for corruption, which uh, 
will be something that Ukraine will really, really have to manage very carefully. So thank you very much. I realize we didn't get to all of the questions, so I think our panelists will be able to stick around for a few minutes if you are here in person and have a question that you'd like to ask them individually. Um, but I know we're coming up on uh, the end of our time together, so I just want to thank you all again for joining us, whether you're here in person or on Zoom, and also really thank you to all of my colleagues for sharing your insights and helping us uh, leave today with kind of a better sense of where we are um, and where we might be going in this conflict and its next step. So please join me in thanking our panelists for today. Thank you.